Welcome to Passion Church. For more information about Passion Church, please visit us online at www.passionchurch.tv. Now let's join the service already in progress. I want to place a demand this morning on you. I want to place a demand on your memory. Um, I preached the first message in this series almost four weeks ago. You know we don't normally do that. We just start and go right through. But because of uh, the situations and circumstances we faced as a body, uh, I preached the first message in this series almost four weeks ago. And uh, for those of you that have not been with us, let me just bring you up to speed quickly. We are right in the middle of attacking five principalities that I felt like that the Lord revealed to me in July of last year that we needed to uh, combat as a body and individually. Principalities are basically set in place by principles. It's the way you think. And so we started that process. And so we've talked about uh, the first principality was isolation. And we said that we were never created to live life alone. We are uh, in this together. And so we combated that for three months. We talked about body, uh, how to operate in the body, and how to have friends, and how to deal with conflict, and so we we said, you know, we're not designed for isolation. The second principality was poverty, and we made this statement to you regarding poverty, that that, uh, God will, uh, he, he breaks the spirit of poverty in our life, not by increasing how much money we have. He breaks the spirit of poverty in our life by teaching us to manage what we already have. How many of you know you could probably live on what you already have if you didn't have to go to Starbucks nine times a day, right? Uh, Because then you have to get a second mortgage. Okay, anyway. uh, uh, So we've dealt with poverty, and we've learned that God breaks that by how we manage what we have. And so in the first message of this series uh, called Heart Attacks, we begin to deal with the third principality. The third principality is, is hopelessness. And I read to you a verse of scripture in Romans, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Paul makes this statement. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is literally making this statement. As a follower of Christ, as somebody in relationship with Jesus, you should overflow with hope. How many of you have met people that say they follow Jesus that overflow with a lot of stuff other than hope? All right, I just wondered if you'd met the same people I'd met. So, so we should be so rich in hope that we have an excess of hope that overflows on those around us. But I would submit to you that most of us uh, struggle with hope. In fact, the cares of life become so strong and so heavy on us that a lot of times we struggle to have hope. And so we come to the place that David came to in Psalm chapter 27, and you'll remember this verse of Scripture, I hope that I read to you, where David said, I would have lost heart. One version says, I would have fainted. One version says, I would have given up hope. And so I submitted to you that our loss of hope is directly attributable to a heart condition. When we lose heart, we lose hope. And he could have just as easily said, I'm about to lose hope. But he said, I'm about to lose heart. But they're, they're equal. If you lose your heart, you will lose hope. If you lose hope, you will lose your heart. And so over the next few weeks, what I want to do is I want to spend some time and I want us to look at some areas in our life where principalities, uh, the principality of hopelessness attacks us. And I want to unmask and pull into light what hopelessness does so that we know how it works so we can uproot it. Because I'm also convinced that most of us are so unaware of the, the subtleness of hopelessness that many of us have given up in areas of our life and we don't even realize it. I'm already preaching and y'all just staring at me through the haze. Uh, 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 we, we don't even realize it. It's so subtle in our life. And so, so what I want to do is I want to take the time and pull back the covers on what hopelessness does and why it is so deadly. And the way I want to do that is I want to look at some very hopeless situations that are found in Scripture. And then after we do that for a couple of weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to segue into an expose on why we should have hope. Because it's not enough to tell us we don't have hope unless we can tell you why we should have hope. And so we're going to look at that. So, so, so I want to read an account to you today in which you will see a glaring example of how isolation and poverty join forces 
so that it paves the way for hopelessness. So then it brings total destruction. I, I have, I, I've already told you this, but I want to remind you, the enemy layers his attacks. Right? How many of you have learned that in life? It's not just one attack. It's one attack, and then a few days later, another attack, and then another attack, and he layers his attack. That's how he wears us down, right? And so we've got to learn how he does this. So, so this is what he does. So, so join me in 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to read a, 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 a a passage of scripture that you may or may not be aware of, but it's an interesting passage of scripture to say the least. Second Kings chapter 6. Are you awake this morning? All right, just want to make sure. Second Kings chapter 6 says this. At a later time, this. Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, pulled together his troops and he launched a siege on Samaria. This brought on a terrible famine. So bad that food prices soared astronomically. Eighty shekels for a donkey's head. Five shekels for a bowl of field greens. They overpaid if they paid for field greens. But anyway, that's a whole different story. Five shekels for a bowl of field greens. One day the king of Israel was walking along the city wall and a woman cried out, Help, your majesty. And he answered, If God won't help you, where on earth can I go for help? To the granary? To the dairy? The king continued, Tell me your story. Listen to what she says. This woman came to me and said, Give up your son and we'll have him for today's supper. And tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and we ate him. Let that sink in. How desperate do you have to be? The next day I told her, Your turn. Bring your son so we can have him for supper. But she has hidden her son away. When the king Heard the woman's story, he ripped apart his robe, and since he was walking on the city wall, everyone saw that next to his skin he was wearing coarse burlap, and he called out, God, do his worst to me and more. If Elisha, the son of Shaphat, still has a head on his shoulders at this day's end, Elisha was sitting at home, and the elders were sitting with him, and the king had already dispatched an executioner, but before the man arrived, Elisha spoke to the elders, Do you know that this murderer has just now sent a man to take off my head? Look, when the executioner arrives, shut the door and lock it. Don't, even, don't I now even hear the footsteps of his master behind him? And when he was giving his instructions, the king showed up accusing. This trouble, listen to this, is directly from God. And what's next? Listen to this statement. And I'm fed up with God. This account has to be one of the most serious and graphic examples of hopelessness chronicled in Scripture. The enemy has laid siege. Uh, l- let me say it like this. To, they, they have laid siege to Samaria. Pick this up. They have surrounded Samaria. They have cut them off. See if this word sounds familiar. They have isolated them. And now after isolation has done its work, the next principality sets up in place and they find themselves trapped by poverty. Right? They're isolated. Now they find themselves trapped by poverty and, and because how, how broke do you have to be? How broke and trapped by poverty do you have to be that, that, that this takes place? Because this is one of the most broken accounts found in Scripture where two mothers come together and they come up with this gruesome and this stomach-turning scheme. Here's the plan. We make a covenant with one another and we'll cook our children for dinner. The one woman follows up and, and makes good on the plan, and, and she gives her uh, child, and they cook the child for supper. And Scripture says that the other lady bellies up to the baby buffet and has dinner, and then she hides her child. Poverty. And then we see what happens, because now they're isolated, and isolation has poured the foundation for poverty, and now poverty seals the deal, and guess what the third thing? thing that happens they lose hope here's what happens I am literally revealing to you how the enemy works in our life today he isolates us he brings us into a spirit of brokenness and then all of a sudden hopelessness sets in 
See, the king is drawn into this situation, and after hearing what they've done, he is so distraught that he, that he makes this statement, I'm fed up with God. That is the height of hopelessness. Hopelessness, the end game. You need to know this this morning. The hopelessness, the, the end game of hopelessness is to get you to give up on God. That's why the enemy wants to make you hopeless is so that you will come to the conclusion that God can't even help you. And then not only that, he, the king gets fed up with God, but just as a side note, he not only gets fed up with God, uh, he, gets, he gets fed up with Elisha, the man of God. Okay. Uh, and he sends an executioner to, to kill him. And we'll come back to that here in, the moment, in a moment. I want to share three quick thoughts with you about hopelessness so that we understand how it works. Number one, I want you to understand out of this account we can learn this. Hopelessness is deadly because it will cause you to consume your tomorrow today. I'm preaching and I hadn't preached in a while. I just went right back into it. Hopelessness will cause you to consume your tomorrow today. Stay with me this morning. These babies that these two women uh, had made this pact concerning were these ladies' heritage. Do you understand that these ladies, that, that their future was completely and totally tied up into these two small boys? Do you understand that these two small boys had been born into what is a patriarchal system, which means all these ladies' legal rights are tied into these boys. If, the, if either one of these ladies, if their husbands are killed in battle, if their husbands die of natural causes, doesn't matter how they die, instantly all of their future is tied up in these little boys. Because without these little boys, they cannot obtain the inheritance that they deserve because of the fact that there's no male presence. Okay, y'all are looking at me. Um, these boys carried all the legal rights and all the ownership of property with them. These ladies, literally in this moment, because of hopelessness, they forfeit their entire future because they're hopeless. Um, in fact... Let me just put it this way. The male child in this particular uh, uh, culture was so, so desired that if a woman did not have a male child, they were considered less than equal with the other women in the community. And, check this out. Stay, I'm going to come back to this, so please remember this phrase. And the male child was so important that we have record that people would do stupid stuff just to get a male child, i.e., Abraham and Sarah and Ishmael, and we're dealing with the results of that even today, right? So, 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 so here they are. These ladies are so swallowed up and consumed by hopelessness that they willingly kill the male child. The immediate overruled their ability to have long-term foresight and any ability to think past their now need. Okay, y'all are with me, right? Because it's getting ready to get tight in here. Because isn't that what we do when we become hopeless? When we allow the principality to set up hopelessness in our life, isn't this exactly what we do today? We do it like this. It, it's not exactly like they did it and in, in, in what our actions kind of. What we do is stuff like this. We'll settle for anybody because I'm lonely. And I'm hopeless that I'll ever be able to find the right one, so I'll take anyone. And even though I realize that they cost me my peace because every time I go home to them, I lose my peace. And time I go out on a date with them, I lose my peace. But I'm, I'm willing to sell my peace because I don't want to be a they cost me my health, they cost me my money, they cost me my sanity, they cost me all of that, but I'm so lonely that I'll just settle for anybody because I don't want to be alone and your hopelessness cost you your future. God can't even send you the right one because your hands are full of the wrong. Okay. Uh, I, I'm so desperate for acceptance today that I will make choices and decisions and do things that will cost me my future reputation tomorrow and it will haunt me the rest of my life. But I'm so desperate to be received and I'm so desperate to be accepted and I'm so desperate to be loved and so desperate to be liked that I will make a decision today that I will have to try to live down the rest of my life because I'm hopeless. Hopeless. 
I'm so hopeless in the area of my finances that I will make a choice today that will bankrupt me for decades to come because, but because I'm trying to impress the people that live next to me that I don't even like. I will make decisions and use cards and I will bankrupt my entire future and not only my future, my children's future because I'm hopeless that anything's ever going to change and surely the next pair of jeans and surely the next car and surely the next house is going to satisfy my need and my longing. Hopelessness tries to get us to become nearsighted. All we can see is the desperation of the immediate. We consume what we need for later now. And I want to make a statement to you that I think is is very appropriate for us in in the stage of these principalities that we're dealing with because I want you to understand what happens. When we become hopeless, we will literally kill stuff that other people would kill to have. Y'all missed it. Some of you right now, you're, you're, in, you're, you're married and, and, and you, your, your spouse is driving you crazy and you destroy them and you, you want to get away from them and there are other people in the room going, boy, if I just had a spouse like that, I would be so happy. She takes such good care of him. She's so loving. He's so kind. And, and, if, and we will kill stuff that other people would kill to have. Oh, um, okay. We will, we will not even show up at a job and clock in because we have, we've allowed hopelessness in the, in the, uh, towards a, prom- a promotion or a raise to set in. And other people are standing around being unemployed by different companies and they're going, I would kill to have that job. And we won't even get up out of bed and show up on time. And we want to clock out early and play solitaire at our desk all day rather than doing work because we've allowed hopelessness to set in. And other people would kill to have what we have. Okay, it's going to get real tight now because some of you, some, some would kill to have the church you have. <laughs> but you walk away because you're hopeless. Hopeless. Oof. See, the truth is this morning is we're all going to encounter what this king encountered. What he encountered was one day. You go back and read. It says one day he was walking on the wall. One day that will make us think it is our last day. And in that moment, if we are not careful on that one day, we will make a rest of our days altering decision. One day can change the the trajectory and the path of your entire life. And if you allow hopelessness to take up root in your heart, you will make a decision on that one day that will cost you the rest of your life. There's a second truth. uh, Because uh, I've learned that more times than not, choices made in the moments of hopelessness leads us to regrets and wounds. And and we see that in this account. But not only does hopelessness cause me to consume my future. The second thing I've learned about hopelessness is this, is that hopelessness will cause you to consume someone else's future. You stop and think about what happens. That is one of the most dangerous aspects of hopelessness that is revealed in this account is that hopelessness will not only bring you to the place where you are willing to consume your future, but you will also willingly consume the future of those around you. It was bad enough that this woman had suffered, uh, had offered and eaten her own son. But now, check this out, now she is so hopeless that she wants the king's help, not for food from the granary, and not from, for food from the, the, the king's private stock. She doesn't even ask for any of that. You know what she asked for? Find this kid so we can cook him and eat him. How hopeless do you have to be to not only consume your own future and deal with the pain of that? She has dealt with the pain of eating her own child. And now she is so extremely hopeless that she pushes aside her own pain knowing what she's lived through. Come on now, I'm preaching right now. Some of y'all have lived through some stuff that you wouldn't wish on, you wouldn't think you would wish on anyone, but you're so hopeless that when you see somebody else going through what you're going, you went through, there's almost a spirit of joy about you because I went. She begs the king. Find this son so I can eat him. 
There was no remorse over what she had done. You would have thought the pain of what she had lost would have gripped her to the degree that, that she would have said, don't, I, I, I break this covenant. It's not the right. But instead, she was so hopeless and hopelessness had set up in her so deeply that she, she now becomes destructive in her own desire and she wants to finish the plan. I am convinced that one of the greatest dangers of hopelessness is this. After we've consumed our own future, we want other people to feel that pain. We must uproot and rip hopelessness out of our hearts because if we become convinced that nothing will ever change, it is at that moment that we become an accessory in the enemy's plot to spread pain. We begin to cooperate with him. And while he's trying to destroy others because he's destroyed you already and he pushes you off to the side and he's accomplished his task, if we allow hopelessness to set up in our lives, we begin to cooperate with the enemy and we will begin to propagate pain in somebody else's life because we've lived through it. Now we want everybody else to live through it. That's why because of your divorce, now every time you find somebody that's interested in you, you propagate the pain of what that guy did to you onto them. And he's not him, but you treat him like him because of what he did. We'll do the same thing in business relationships. Somebody does us wrong, and so now we propagate that onto the next business. I don't trust you. I won't take you at your word. I know you've got a proven track record, but I will be suspicious of you from now till Jesus comes back because that mechanic shop did me wrong 22 years ago. I didn't need a starter. They sold me a starter. And so now every mechanic I go to after that, you've got to be a thief. All mechanics are thieves. How many of us out of the hopelessness of our own lives, have reached out and consumed someone else's dreams, someone else's hopes, someone else's future, someone else's plans. We not only sabotage our own future, and but we begin to take an active role in crushing those around us. And we disguise it because what we will do is we will use statements like this, I'm not happy. So that gives me license to destroy you because I'm not happy. When the real statement should not be I'm not happy, the real statement we ought to say is I'm not hoping. Because I have no hope. I don't want you to have any. Okay, y'all are, some of y'all not liking this. See, out of hopelessness, we will say things that with no regard for the long-term impact that they will have on others. Out of hopelessness, we will take actions with no regards for the devastation that it will produce in those around us. We take no thought. We take no concern. We don't pause. There's no remorse. We just want my hunger dealt with. I want my need met. I want my desire met. I want my feelings to be better. I want to be happy. I want to be content. I want to be satisfied. Can I tell you this morning that one of the sure signs that you have been overtaken by hopelessness is you will become self-centered. Because since I have no hope anymore, it's all about me. I'm depressed. I got no reason to live. And because I've got no reason to live, I don't like it that you've got a reason to live. And so I will do my dead level best for you to experience what I'm experiencing. Because I, because here it is right here. Here it is. Misery does love company. Mm. Your conversations will begin to revolve around you and you will consume others in an attempt to answer your lack of hope. That's the two most dangerous aspects of hopelessness. You will consume your future and without batting an eye, you will consume the future of your children and your neighbors and your church family and your friends. Because if I don't have any hope, you shouldn't have any hope. Now, the third lesson I want to just mention briefly because I've talked about this I don't know how many times, and I'm, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I see it so obvious here, and I think finally, I've said this to you before, I don't understand why this is true until now. I think I have finally figured it out, and that is this. Hopelessness will cause you to attack the assigned. Okay. I have never understood, but I think now 
I've got the root. Because I've never understood how people can walk away from and can badmouth and can attack people who really all they wanted to do and all they were assigned to do was help. But I think I got it. Because I think what happens is that hopelessness sets up and hopelessness causes us to attack the assigned that God has placed in our life. See, I, I can see this from this account, uh, this account. I can see this. I can see hopelessness is contagious. Did you know that? Hopelessness is contagious. That, that's what happens in this account. These, womans were, these women were hopeless, and it rubs off on the king. And now he is hopeless to the point that he makes this statement, I am fed up with God. They wrote it nice. I don't know that he said it that nice. I think he had some choice words. I'm fed up with God. But since he couldn't get to God, <laughs> don't y'all wish you could get to God sometimes? Sometimes I wish, I wish God would meet me in a, like a dark alley somewhere sometimes. I don't know that I would like the results, but there are moments I wish, but I figured somehow I can't get to him. I can't destroy him. He's undefeated. But he's so angry at God that he realizes I can't get to God, so I'll do the next best thing. I'll get to God's assigned. Okay. Um, so he goes after God's man, Elisha. There's only one problem. Elisha had been assigned by God as his answer. Y'all don't get it. He sends an executioner to destroy Elisha. And if he succeeds, not only does the king die, and not only does the king starve to death, the entire city of people will starve to death, but he's so hopeless and so fed up with God that he determines in his heart, I'm going to kill Elisha. And the dilemma was is that you go read the rest of the story. Elisha was assigned one day later to speak a word that would break the famine. Go read it for yourself. Elisha stands up the next day and said, the famine is over. How many of us, because we've given up hope, attack and kill and cut and cut off and cuss out and dismiss relationships with the very one that God has positioned and assigned into our lives to bring the answer we so desperately need? We crucify the ones that, that would break what is causing our hopelessness. And God has placed, this. I believe this is a prophetic word for somebody this morning. God has placed somebody in your life. He has assigned somebody to your life that has a famine-breaking word for you. And if you walk away from them, if you attack them, if you destroy them, you are destroying your own future. Hopelessness causes us to walk away from the assigned. We intentionally hurt them and we silence the word that they had and it, we lose it forever. They have the key for our breakthrough, but our hopelessness rises up and we add another lock to the door and we push them further away and we distance ourselves from our designated deliverers. You've heard it about, you, you know what a designated driver is, but did you know that God puts the designated deliverers in your life? He assigns people to us that right in the midst of our hopelessness, right in the midst of isolation, they try to push their way in. Right in the midst of our brokenness, they try to push their way in. And if we're not careful, our hopelessness will cause us to attack the one that God sent to deliver. Too many of us send out executioners. I ain't never hired a hit man. But we'll send messages and we'll make comments. And we'll give them that look. Y'all know that look. Y'all know because you reserve that look for your children and the people you don't like. We'll cut, we'll cut our eyes and we distance them. Reminds me of an individual recorded in scripture that was hanging on a cross next to the Savior of the world. His One had already figured it out. When you get into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. No problem. I got you, bro. 
This isn't going to be any fun, what we're getting ready to go through. It's going to hurt a little bit, but one day, in fact, by the end of this day, you will be with me in paradise. The other guy attacks the deliverer. And I've watched many of you, when God has positioned people for you, for such a time as this, for somebody will, I, I can see it. I, I've watched it play out over and over again. God has assigned them, given them a word. It's an uncomfortable word. You don't like the word because it calls you into account for the stupid stuff you're doing. But we become so hopeless that we will in turn turn and attack them. And I don't know why they keep preaching at me. And I wish they'd leave me alone and mind your own business. And we never stop to think that maybe, just maybe, our answer is tied up in them. So, who are you attacking that might be your deliverer? Children. Listen, I know your parents get on your nerves, but maybe they're assigned. Husbands, I know it sounds like nagging, but maybe that sixth sense and that women's intuition that we think is a fallacy is a reality, and maybe she's a sign. Wife, what? He's demanding. Maybe God has placed him in your life to build guardrails and protections around you. Friend. We attack the assignment. So tell me your story. What's causing your hopelessness? What is causing you to do things and be so nearsighted that you will make decisions in February of 2016? that will produce destruction in your life in your February 2030. What's causing that? Tell me your story. Why are you so dead set on destroying your son's life? Why are you so dead set on destroying your daughter's life with words? Why are you so dead set on destroying and bringing pain into your co-worker's life? Are you so hopeless that you become heartless? Why? Have you shaken your head because you can't seem to figure out why you continue to say what you say and react the way you react when somebody tries to help you? I don't understand why I do this. Every time they try to help me, I just push them away. Every time they try to be nice to me, I just, I just can't help myself. I just got to tell them off. Why? May I submit to you this morning? I know why. Hopelessness. Hopelessness has set up in your heart It's a heart attack. That's why Solomon said, rightfully so, above all else, guard your heart. He didn't say guard your possessions. He didn't say guard guard your car. He didn't say guard your house. He didn't say guard your dog. He didn't say guard your property. He said, listen, above all else, guard your heart because he recognized if you lose heart, you lose hope. And if you lose hope, the principalities begin to work together in harmony. You will become isolated. And out of your isolation, you will become broke. And out of your brokenness, the third principality piles on. And you begin to literally believe nothing will ever change. And at that moment... You will consume your future and the future of the people around you and you will attack those that have been assigned to help. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, your word says that we should not be ignorant, unlearned. That's what that means. We should not be unlearned 
about how the enemy works. In order for us to defeat the enemy of our soul, you are telling us that we have to recognize how he works. And what I've come to grips with in my own life, and I believe in the lives of each one of us standing here, is this. God, the enemy, he's an old dog and he doesn't have very many new tricks. He uses the same systems of destruction over and over again and we, we continue to fall prey. And what I see is that if we're not careful, these principalities set up in our life and we allow ourselves to become isolated, surrounded, but isolated. Poverty walks in and we, we become bankrupt, not just financially, we become bankrupt relationally, spiritually, mentally, physically. We become bankrupt, we're broke. And then hopelessness sets in. And we honestly come to the conclusion that nothing will ever change. And we become fed up with you, God. And we become fed up with those that you sent to us. And we consume. Out of desperation, we consume our own futures. And then we turn our appetites on those around us. Father, if there's one this morning that's here that would say, I'm hopeless. I've become convinced that nothing will change. I pray this morning that they would recognize how the enemy works and they would grab hopelessness by the neck and they would uproot that principality out of their own life and they would take on the mind of Christ and they would become what Paul says we could become. We could become people that overflow with hope. What I see with my natural eyes may not even agree with what I see with my spiritual eyes. And that's always produced hopelessness in me because I give so much weight to what I can naturally see. But this morning, I make a choice from this point forward whether what I see with my natural eyes ever changes or not. I choose to see what I see with my spiritual eyes and I recognize that I cannot be overcome and I cannot be overtaken and I cannot become overwhelmed because I belong to you. And so I hope again and I believe again and I come to that place where the yet rise up, rises up in me. And I hold on. And I allow deliverers to walk below, alongside me and I don't attack them. And I get farsighted. I look to my destiny and my purpose and my future. And become less consumed and concerned about what's taking place right now. Because I know one day it's all going to change. I ask that you would accomplish this. It's been a privilege to have you join us for this time of ministry. To find more Passion Church resources or to make a donation online, visit www.passionchurch.tv. Remember, you can't live without passion.